Hey, this is Walter Schreifels from Quicksand, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The New Scene. This is Keith. And Tommy. And we are back with a brand new episode. And on tonight's show, Dan Mueller of Wilderun. Now, folks, if you have not heard this band, you want to do it very, very soon. Progressive metal outfit out of Massachusetts. We love the new album on Century Media, Epigon. Real pleasure to talk to Daniel. You're going to love the conversation. It's coming up momentarily. I really like talking to him because I think it was about a quarter of the way through the interview. We figured out like, oh, you went to Berkeley. That a lot of <laughs> a lot of this makes sense now. <laughs> like there was a real moment of like, all right, so how do you program this or how do you doing that? And he was like, well, actually, my background is in and we're like, oh, the uh, all of the pieces fit together in that like there are clearly very gifted musicians, but the song structures are just they're really long songs, but they seem like a singular composition that flows really well. So I'm like, fuck, this is like really smart. Like there's, <laughs> this isn't me sitting in my basement being like, all right, the next part's going to go like this. Chug, chug, yeah. chug. Like it, it was really well done. So like, uh, I love talking to him. I love talking to people about that type of like, uh, when they have that level of understanding with music, it's really neat to talk to them just because they have such a level of insight that most people don't have. Yeah, it's this is an album I've gone back to and listened to again and again after we recorded. It it go it it's more in the metal world. We didn't forget our metal friends out there. No. You know, there it starts with some acoustic soft stuff and goes into straight blast beats and it really spans the gamut of different sounds. You're going to love it. You're going to love the conversation and that is coming up soon. Now, let's get some business out of the way, folks. We are continuing to ask for your support. We need ratings. We need Apple podcast ratings and we need Spotify ratings. Now, the other podcasts, I have taken a peek at the other podcasts. They have hundreds of reviews, hundreds. And I need the same from you, our dear listeners. Go into the Apple podcasts app, click on the new scene, scroll down and give us a five star review. If you leave a review, we'll read it on the air. Uh, but if you don't want to leave a review, just give us five stars. Go into the Spotify app, search the new scene. Right under our name is the rating system. Give us five stars. I'm going to keep hammering away until you get us over 100 reviews. And we'll still keep doing it after that, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to stop us. <laughs> like, yeah, we'll, we'll just do it a little less. Yeah. But listen, we got to get over 100. I, I, I have made the statement we have to, and that's it. That's final. And you can purchase our shirt. The Long Sleeve Life is Music is Life shirt is available now at the Death Wish Inc. store. Search the new scene. You'll, the shirt will pop right up. They're out there. They are shipping. People are wearing them. Send us a picture of you and your shirt. We'll post it. They're out there. They look great. They're fantastic. I got mine in the mail, Tommy. I'm really excited. And here's some extra motivation, folks. Here's some extra motivation. We have a shirt to give away. Uh, a listener has kindly donated a shirt. He loves the show but he will get in trouble if he brings one more shirt into the house. Uh, (laughs) Search Vino Sangre on Instagram. That's Vino, S-A-N-G-R-E, screen printing, has donated the shirt. It is a size medium. Leave an Apple Podcast review, five stars, and make sure you leave a way that we can contact you in the review. Put your Instagram handle or something. We will pick a winner to get the shirt, and I'll ship it out to you. Now, I've been a little lax about contest rules and all this stuff in the past, but it has to be an Apple Podcast review, and it has to be five stars. So enter to win the size medium shirt. It is a size medium, so if you are 6'2", 170 pounds like me, it probably will not, it won't fit you. It won't fit you. So, you know, if you're a smaller frame, skinnier person, the size medium is a good shirt for you. So... Leave a review, get the shirt. Simple as that. What do you think of that, Tommy? The perfect springtime shirt. I just got mine in the mail. I'm ready to go. I, I It's already washed, folded. It's ready to be worn. There you go. Yep. There you go. You want this shirt. Trust me. I can't wait to wear it. Now, don't forget to support our sponsor, 
iodine recordings as well. They just announced a new signing, which we mentioned last week. Hey, thanks. Tommy, I think Hey, Thanks is going to be one of my new favorite bands. They just released another new single, This Small Space. Oh, my God. It, it, Tommy, this song has gone on to my personal playlist. It's also, it's really, really, really good in that I could hear that being played like on regular radio. Like it's that kind of yes. like, it's that kind of like, it's rock, it's pop, but it's at the same time, it's has its kind of indie rock sensibility to it. But yeah, it 100, these guys could be fucking huge. Yeah. If they're, if they're not huge after this record comes out, the world is just a really cruel yeah. and unkind and unfair place because this band is fantastic. I can't wait to hear the record. This small space is on our new scene, Spotify 2022 playlist. Click the link tree in our bios, listen to the playlist, or just search the new scene 2022 playlist on Spotify. Listen to it. Also, we posted our audio karate episode today, and I've been dropping the song Lovely Residence and all the story. That song, I cannot get it out of my head now. That song is also on my personal playlist. It's also on the new scene 2022 playlist. Great song, great bands, great stuff. Check it out. So we're moving on to some more new music. There's a lot of music stuff going on. Vane, The World is Going to Ruin You. The LP is out now. Tommy, this thing is everything that I hoped for and more. They didn't change their sound too much. They have only sharpened it and made it more precise. The album is absolutely brutal. I love it. I love what they're doing. I hope I get to see them again at, at some point. My favorite track is Lights Out. The breakdown that pops up in that song is just, oh my God. And they like slow down the riffage in this one point and it just gets slower and heavier. Unbelievably good album. I really think this is the kind of, they're doing things uh, sonically that most bands aren't. And I like the fact that they blended this idea of like Dillinger Escape Plan kind of chaotic metal that also is so cleanly done in that like it goes all over the place but it's somehow unified it's really really smart and really fun like i love listening to it but it it is very intense yeah it's a great record looking forward to more from Vane and folks we have a new band alert a new band alert now when we put you onto a new band you know it's going to be fantastic. You know it's going to be the best. So check out this band as soon as you're done listening to the podcast. The band is Abrasion. The record is Born to Be Betrayed. And my favorite song is Face to Face. Now, if you hear the breakdown at the end of Face to Face and do not feel anything, you must not be a human being because, <laughs> wow, this is just great, moshy, hardcore. It's not super progressive. It's not super complicated. It's just very, very, very good. Mashi hardcore. I love it. You know what they did a really good job of is they do they mix the breakdowns with that. A couple of the bands I've heard do something similar to this. Like Punishment used to do it a lot. Is uh almost Slayer like uh, interlude kind of parts where it's like chun 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 chun. Like they have those like higher sections that harmonize absolutely brutal and you know what threw me is the cover looks like if somebody was like here's an early 90s crust slash grind band I'd be like yeah that that seems to fit like the artwork seems to fit in exactly with that like it even has like the pointy kind of like hard to read logo <laughs> that's like, what i liked best that's yeah. what caught my eye i was like i have to listen to this yeah but um yeah uh, my favorite track is I, I liked death's embrace that was my favorite one they're, they're yeah. but they are a really fucking good band. I'm really glad you 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 found them because they are super heavy. Just uh, yeah. In the, if you're a big fan of like of that old like Marauder kind of like old school hardcore Hundred Demons that kind of stuff, uh, this is right up your alley. Check it out. Abrasion will also be on our Spotify New Scene 2022 playlist. Boy, that's a mouthful. Okay. <laughs> And to wrap up this segment, Tommy, I have gone to a gig. I have seen a gig and played St. Vitus this past Friday night. And oh my goodness, I'm so glad I went. Now, I didn't get there in time for Wake, 
because I had a thing from 7 to 8 p.m. and I didn't get to the venue till 8.30, but Yashira opened. I like them a lot. They're kind of slower, doomier, hardcore. Portrayal of Guilt, who I had not seen before, played. They're a really interesting three-piece, heavy, experimenting with different sounds, incredible tone on the bass and guitar, really unique. Absolutely love what they're doing. And then End. Oh my goodness. I... I, I'm so glad I saw them at St. Vitus because it's a small venue and I was up front, you know, close to the action, people moshing into me. It felt like old times. <laughs> I think St. Vitus has a new sound system. It just sounded absolutely massive. Incredible band on record and live. Got to say hi to Greg Thomas. Oh, you know? nice. It was, so it was nice to catch up with him for a second. Really great band. I I recommend you see them if you get the chance, Tommy. I've been following Portrayal of Guilt for a long time now, uh, just in that they were on somebody's end of year list about three or four years ago. They put out an album called uh, Let Pain Be Your Guide, and I remember there's a track on there called Daymare, like Nightmare, but with day in the beginning. Uh, absolutely crushing. And it's it. they kind of run between, I almost think of them as like, like early 90s screamo influence they kind of have that yeah. kind of feel to them as well um but they do have really really heavy parts yeah it was a great show i'm glad i went this was an action-packed weekend you're gonna hear about more of that in segment three tommy and i met up in person we hung out at our friend gary's 40th birthday party there were some all-stars there colin from circus survive mike from this day forward many controversies many uh occurrences well, no controversies, but listen, <laughs> we'll recap the party. We had a great time hanging out. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about some other stuff in segment three. But right now, we are going to talk to Dan Mueller of Wilderun. Enjoy. All right, folks, we're here now with Dan Mueller. Dan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. It's great to have you here. You know, we really enjoy the music of Wilderun. We've been listening to the latest album a lot, and we're going to get there, Dan. But first, I've got to ask, how are you doing today? I am doing well. Uh, just went uh, went sledding with my family and stuff, so that's nice to like enjoy the winter time for once instead of just being cold for a while. So, uh, what what's your family situation? Um, just uh, just my wife and my son, and we're uh, we're just kind of all at home, you know, as as most of us are, which. Uh, which has been actually very nice, being able to spend more time at home instead of having to like go into the office or something like that all the time. Right. How old's your son? He is four. Nice. So you've got your hands full all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a little maniac, but he's great. So tell us, uh, let's get to know you a little bit, Dan. Where did you grow up? I grew up right around here, actually. I, I've been staying put. Everyone else in the band has been moving around a bunch, and I have been stubbornly a, a mass hole for a while <laughs> so <laughs> but uh but yeah i mean I, I i grew up around here um my my parents moved over uh from germany when uh well when my dad was like a teenager and then met my mom back in germany and um then they moved over here got married started a family so and i've just kind of been living in mass and traveling back and forth between mass and uh uh, Germany to visit my family back there. So it's it's kind of like a, a little bit of a split situation, but end of the day, I'm definitely like, the U.S. is definitely my home. So your family that lives in Germany, is it your parents or extended family? Extended family. So like my grandparents, cousins, aunts and uncles and so forth. How often do you go over there? I, I've been trying to go over there like every two years or so. I was actually just over there um, right as the pandemic pandemic was starting like i was in there in march 2020 and we just couldn't like really do much you know we had plans to like oh we're gonna go into munich and we're gonna go visit austria and stuff and just a lot of stuff just ended up getting shut down as we were there and then i was i was asleep and i, I woke up one one morning to just like hundreds of texts and missed calls from my family back uh, or, or family and friends back uh back on the u.s being like the borders are shutting down you gotta get back here right now like i was like oh my god so i had to like 
quickly reschedule a flight, you know, in, in this panicked state, you know, and uh, made it back just in time before anything shut down. Yeah, that's good because some people got stranded in different countries being on tour or just traveling or whatever else. Yeah, I had no idea what to expect, you know, this like... And, you know, on one hand, I was like, well, okay, I'm I'm a U.S. citizen and I'm a German citizen. And if I were to be stuck in Germany, at least, you know, I, I'm not like staying in a hotel. I have family around. But at the same time, it's like, I got to get home. I got to work and pay the bills. And I got cats at home. So it's like, you know, there's just a lot of obligations. It's like, I can't risk, I can't risk getting stuck over there. Exactly. Dan, do you speak German? I do, like, conversationally, like, if if you're... Like, if we're talking, like, you know, basically, like, middle school, high school level, like, you know, I can talk to you about, like, day-to-day stuff, but if you're, like, gonna ask me, like, what's the government situation, I'd be like, uh, sorry, can't help you there, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my, my wife speaks pretty decent, like, pretty decent German. Uh, she grew up in a house, her whole one side of the family emigrated here when, uh, in like the mid fifties. So they grew up in a household where her parent, her mother, um, and all her aunts and uncles all spoke German in the house. But when they went to school, um, they spoke English, but like Kelly's mother still will in the middle of a sentence, like completely switch and flip to German when they don't want me to understand what they're talking about. <laughs> it's it's a nice little uh, code. <laughs> <laughs> so I was reading about you, Dan, and I read that you were initially inspired musically by Weird Al. Is this true? That is entirely true. <laughs> now, let, let's talk about this because I too am a Weird Al fan. He's the man. Yeah. I mean, that that was like groundbreaking stuff when you were a kid. Yeah, I, it's like, you know, I, I heard music all the time growing up. My family is a big music fan, so there's always stuff playing, dinner time, whatever. It's, but when I when I first got introduced to Weird Al, I was like, oh my God, it's like the, the reaction I got from that, you know, it was just like, this is hilarious. And it's like, it's songs that I recognize or even ones that I don't, you know, that would catch my ear and be like, oh my God, that's this is great. And then when you're, especially when you're like, you know, 12, 13 years old, that's, that's your jam right there. And then I actually like started discovering artists through Weird Al's parodies. So like, I I could say that like Weird Al was kind of my, my very early Genesis introduction to heavier rock music. You know, he had that, uh, smells like teen spirit, uh, parody, and uh, so I was like, oh, man, I, li- I like this song. And I was like, there's, there's something more aggressive about it. I mean, it's still hilarious. But then I was like, Who- who's who's the original artist? Oh, Nirvana? Oh, okay, let me check out their stuff. And then, you know, I started, like, really getting into Nirvana from then. And it's like, the stuff that really intrigued me about that was, like, uh, the Bleach album in particular. I was like, there's just a lot of, like, gnarly songs on there. I was like, man, this is cool this is even heavier than the than the weird al stuff and then from there i just kind of like just kept snowballing until um like the first metal band that i heard that like i really fell in love with was was dream theater and that was kind of like that yes. opened the floodgates for me yes see we were talking about will to run before the show and tom you know we we're like talking about listening to the album and everything tommy's like did you ever hear dream theater and I was like, no, but <laughs> that was the comparison that he made. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I, I think the the comparison I really was thinking in terms of like, well, we'll talk more about the, the, the new album later. I think the one of the things I think that hit me is that you guys structure songs in a way that allows you to explore a theme, but not only just a theme kind of musically but lyrically and i i I really enjoy that kind of dichotomy of like being able to go between those two things and you guys you're all amazing musicians so it's it's very easy to like sit down and listen to it and kind of get lost in the moment i just that was the comparison i kept thinking of was like wow i really kind of lost myself in this the same way i do with like when i listen to dream theater yeah i mean i think a lot of it um a lot of it what i've been finding out people kind of describe it as as like cinematic and the 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 more I think about it, the more I find actual like parallels between Wilderun's song structures and and like cinema more than I do like your typical band. Because I th- I think it is so much about the arc. You know, we've like tried we've tried like writing 
shorter songs and stuff. Like for instance, like on uh, Veil of Imagination, uh, Far From Where Dreams Unfurl was the original demo of that song was like four and a half, five minutes long or something like that. And it was like, Evan had written it to be like, like let's experiment with like shorter, simpler structures and let's see what that sounds like in a Wilderon context. And then we listened to it. It's like, it's cool, but it just, it doesn't go somewhere, you know? And it's like, so then we extend that the, the various sections and we kind of like elaborate on certain ideas and just kind of ring it out more. And end of the day, it turns into, you know, what, like nine, 10 or 11 minutes, whatever that song is. And, uh, and it's like, oh, now it sounds like a Wilderon song because by the time you get to the end of it, you feel like you've earned the big bombastic ending. Yeah, <laughs> there's that crescendo it comes to and you're like, ah, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. That's sick. Exactly. If, and if that happens, you know, 30 seconds into a song, you know, with no lead up or anything, it's like this. It feels it feels hollow. It's che- I feel like it's cheap. It's it. There's a cheapness to that of like, OK, there's the hook. OK, there's the chorus. Let's go back to the bridge. Oh, and there's the hook again. It's like you got to sometimes really kind of flesh things out and really feel them out. And I think when you have people that are gifted musicians like you guys do, kind of allowing them to explore that space is really cool. Like it it, it really does kind of fill that atmosphere and it kind of lends itself well to the atmosphere of it. Yeah. And I, I I think the like just the general arrangement of our music with the big orchestras and, and like wild synths and just like this whole hodgepodge of just epicness, like to have that like you, you need to justify that kind of sound, I think, and, and to have just like a basic song structure, you know, doing that verse chorus, verse chorus thing. It, I don't know. It feels a little out of place. I think. I mean, maybe maybe there's a way to do it, and we just haven't figured it out yet. It worth, I wouldn't say it's off the table. I would be personally very interested to see if we could make that happen. Um, it, if not, just for the sake of having some shorter songs to put in a set list for once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you. I think you just do it once out of nowhere, right? Like next record, second song is like a three minute thirty second super catchy single and everyone's like what we weren't expecting this at all i know people complain about our interludes being like almost three minutes long <laughs> oh you guys should do like a napalm death song and do like a 14 second blast and just be like that's it that's the song there you go <laughs> <laughs> just one long tuba <laughs> well cinematic is the first word that came to mind when i was listening to it it's a journey like i i listened to it and you know, with with songs that long, honestly, I, I usually check out, but I'm I'm engrossed with the whole thing, and I'm imagining playing a massive online RPG or crossing a stormy ocean in a big wooden boat, and there's like all different kinds of epic things that come to mind. Yeah, no, I think that's kind of like that's a lot of where our headspace is with it too. I mean, even though lyrically we deal a lot more these days with kind of more introspective things and more human things but like i mean the the way you experience even those small human emotions like i mean they feel grandiose because it's it's you it's everything that encapsulates you as a person so like i think there's a parallel between just you know feeling insecure in some way and then on a personal level and then just you know some like tolkien-esque fantasy realm like there's there's stuff there absolutely so i'm trying to understand your musical background a little more so you say you get into metal through dream theater yes yeah all right so dream theater is the starting point tell us tell us what your thing is like the bands that inspired you the music scenes that inspired you that type of thing yeah i mean it's it's been a long journey of of discovering music and i'm still you know, I'm still, I feel fortunate that I haven't like lost the interest in exploring new music. I'm constantly looking for new things to listen to. Um, even though it gets harder and harder as I get older to be actually impressed by stuff, just, I mean, probably end of the day, just because everything's somewhat derivative of something else. And if I'm not totally in the mood for that, then I can, I, I might write it off a little fast, but, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, from Dream Theater, it was like, I started then kind of like finding some of the more classic bands like Metallica and Black Sabbath, you know, the um, 
Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, all the all the like the origin bands you could say. And I, I kind of lived in in that realm of like classic heavy metal and progressive metal stuff. Um, and I was always kind of like turned off to like all the death metal stuff for for a while. But then one of my friends showed me um, Winter Sun and and Seferum and kind of that blend between those. So those are like the first bands that like had harsh vocals, which I was like not initially into. And then, and then those like blend to that with, with folk instruments and these kind of like Viking like melodies and fantasy. And I was like, well, I'm into all that. So now like you've, you've captivated, captivated me with, with all that. The harsh vocals kind of sit a little better on my tongue now. And, uh, I was then from then I was like, okay, cool. Now, now I've been able to digest this. What else is there? And I, I started then getting to like Behemoth and Nile, and I, I just very quickly went to just like all death metal, all black metal, all the time. And uh, and then it was it like, I mean, from there it was like a long time of of almost exclusively listening to metal. Like th- that that was like most of my metal excursions, and like finding out about like. Opeth, uh, Dimu Borg here, Blind Guardian. I mean, those those are bands that like I'll like I'll listen to the to this day. The like records that I've been listening to for for too long, and I'm like, these are still just as good. When you got into uh, black metal, this is uh, a, a constant like nagging thought in my head. Did you get into like the early stuff, like the the Burzum and the Emperor, or, or did you get more into the symphonic stuff? The symphonic stuff first. I mean, it was it was like Dimu Borgia that really like captured my ear with that. Um, you know, because that was like a good introduction to me. Because like again, it was like I like big epic symphony stuff, and 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 so pairing that with the black metal vibe kind of got me going on that. And then when I did hear bands like Dark Throne or Emperor or Immortal, that's when I was like, oh, okay, cool. Now now I'm ready for this. Like. I, I don't need the, the, the orchestra to, to keep it interesting for me or keep it palatable. That was the word I was looking for. <laughs> palatable. I kept yeah. thinking of like, how do you, how do you get something like that's cause there's sometimes where somebody will introduce me to something and I'm like, no, but there's a way into this. I just got to figure a way there. Like, <laughs> like it's, yeah. Oh, there's so many things. I mean, my entire musical journey so far has been that just like, you know, it's it's like a kid trying broccoli for the first time. You know, like most kids try broccoli and they're like, ew, gross. And then, you know, eventually you grow up and you get like real taste buds and you're like, this is probably pretty good. Yeah, broccoli is seasoned. Whatever they do in the restaurants where it's all seasoned and charred and stuff, it's it's sick. It's so good. Exactly. I mean, it took me forever to like Brussels sprouts even, you know, as, as an adult. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you know, it's interesting. I'm glad we're talking to someone from the more metal side of things because this is an area where I'm a little more ignorant. Tommy listens to a lot more of the black metal and the the genuine metal stuff, but did you go to a lot of the shows as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like the Worcester Palladium was kind of like one of the places I would just basically hang out at because I was just every band, you know, from like age 17 to like 20. 223 i was just like i was constantly going there just because every band that i was listening to would come around there pretty much and so i spent a lot of time there and then after a while it's i don't i don't find myself going to as many metal shows anymore these days because it's like i've seen a lot of the bands before and i don't know i like especially playing metal live i like the sound of distortion coming at me loud and poorly mixed over over live speakers is it's it's a little exhausting <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean after you're doing it for a long time you you have a period where you're inundated in it for a while but as we're getting older and you know as we've been around it for longer i imagine you want something a little quieter when you're not on stage right yeah yeah or or not even just not even quieter like I mean, I I do listen to a lot of generally like dark and aggressive music, but it's you know just something different. You know, like I like industrial music a lot. But when I was in college, that was kind of like my introduction to like electronic music in general, and and that that now like occupies maybe like fifty percent of what I listen to. 
What's the vibe at the metal shows? I don't know if I've ever been to a genuinely metal show. Now, Tommy and I came up in the hardcore scene where there were, you could get beaten up for looking at the wrong person the wrong way. And there, <laughs> there was a lot of craziness. But at metal shows, I just I imagine more fun, more head banging, uh, less craziness. How am I? Am I on point there? Yeah, yeah. I'd say generally speaking, pro- probably depends a bit on on the band you're you're going to see too. You know, if you're gonna see like a like a thrash metal band or like a black metal band or something, like it might be a little more akin to to a hardcore show, maybe. Um, but you know, if you go in to see like Tourist or some kind of like folk metal band, it's like all nerds. You know, so it's like real <laughs> real low key. You know, I I have noticed this in the metal shows I've been to. Uh, the vibe is a lot more fun because people tend to be drunker. Like, ten, yeah. pe- like hard, <laughs> at hardcore shows, people tend to be like, there's like a kind of like fine division of like, all right, there's straight edge kids here. Don't drink too much. They're going to say something. They'll knock the beer out of your hand, whatever. Um, I, I went and I saw uh, a Dying Fetus and a, a couple other bands they were touring with. And it was like, this is the most chilled group of people I've ever seen. Like everybody was like, not everybody, but the vast majority of people were like, Hey man, how you doing? What's up? How are you? Oh, I like your shirt. Like it was very, very relaxed. I was like, I could get used to this. <laughs> there hasn't been a single punch thrown. <laughs> right. I know it's, it's true. I haven't been to a lot of like hardcore shows. So it's like my, like my, my imagination always leads me to, you know, believe that just fists are flying through the air at random which I don't I don't know if that's that's accurate or not, you know, but but I know like people have like people who are not familiar definitely like will have a, like a stigma of like metal is, you know, because it's an aggressive music, the crowd and the people listening to, to it must be equally aggressive. But it's it's at least in my experience is very much not the case. And it's like pretty chill. Yeah, I like that. And yes, there are fists flying at hardcore shows, but uh, it's not like it before. You know, fists are flying, but it's not like because you're getting beaten up or there's crowd killing so much anymore. All the hardcore shows I've been to lately, I haven't felt in danger at all. I think it's it's a lot more controlled now. Was that like more of a thing in the like the the mid 2000s or something? Like that's like when when I like was more familiar with or or like I I had friends around that time that were more into that. So like there was just that image of just like people like throwing haymakers every which way is like (laughs) burned into my memory (laughs) yeah late 90s early 2000s it was it was quite a scene yeah so you're going to metal shows you're checking out metal bands when and how did you decide you wanted to start playing well i uh i I started playing uh when i was 14 um well let me let me back it up a little bit um so when i was i want to say eight years old i I started playing piano kind of because like my parents kind of forced me to they bought a piano and it was like this is yours now i'm like all right i guess i guess i'm gonna do these lessons and then i just and i liked it enough i didn't like i didn't put too much of a fight against it and i'm glad they did because i stuck it out for six years i just did it because it was like i don't know i guess that's what i do now and then um when i was 14 is when I when I heard Weird Al and I was like I want to play polka bass, and I was like and I was like Mom I w- I want to get a bass you know thinking you know like upright bass and all that and she's like okay let's go to the music store and so we go to the music store and I'm like I want a bass and this guy hands me just like a four string you know PV electric bass I'm like I guess that's what I'm playing because that's what he gave me, <laughs> uh, yeah and then it was from there it's just kind of like okay I, I just took that up and I I started you know playing along to songs and found drink there and it was like holy crap I didn't know you could even do stuff like that on an instrument and so then it was like I was about sixteen or so when I started like writing my own music and I I was putting together bands in high school like from like kind of like because I w- wasn't like in any sort of scene and there wasn't really much of a like rock scene in my in my school I was I just kind of like forced my friends to play instruments you know and they begrudgingly did so and we we made some music played some shows and stuff and you know so that was kind of like my my first exposure to like writing music, playing shows and, and like doing some kind of like pseudo re- recording studio stuff. You know, like my, my dad, my dad plays acoustic guitar and, um, 
he had gotten himself a uh, cakewalk software to, so that he could like record himself. And I, so I started messing around with that just cause I was like, I need some way to like demo these songs out. So I just kind of like would mess around with that, just trying to figure it out. And that's kind of what started getting me into music production, which is what I ended up. One of the things I ended up studying at, at Berkeley when I went there. Um, so that was like, you know, that, that, that was kind of like, I, every almost everything that I have done musically has kind of just been out of like necessity. Like there's, I have a problem or I have something that I want and I'm too lazy or too chicken shit to ask anyone else to do it. So then I'll just find a way to do it myself. And that's how I gain skills. Now that I can relate to because <laughs> that's, that's most of my story is being too lazy and too chicken shit to ask anyone else to collaborate with, with me or do anything else. So, <laughs> Well, I didn't ever figure it out myself either, so shit. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you figured out the whole podcasting part by yourself. Yeah, yeah, I get okay, I got to give myself more credit. You know, Dan, it's funny that you mentioned you went to Berkeley because when I was listening to Epigon, I was like, I guarantee one of these guys went to Berkeley. I guarantee it because these arrangements, like this is too refined. Like one of these guys went to Berkeley. I guarantee it. Yeah, we all did. <laughs> that's how, that's yeah, where really? we met. All of you get out. That's where we met. I mean, honestly, <laughs> like, I mean, I, I, I'm eternally grateful for all my, my professors that I had there. And I just, I is all the stories I hear about people saying like, Oh, I, in college, you just learn how to learn. You don't actually learn information. It's like at, at Berkeley, you definitely like if, at least with the majors that I was in, like you're, you're learning some hardcore shit, but like, but meeting, meeting the people that I met there is like, has been vastly more helpful than, than even the, the information. Cause that I could have theoretically gotten out of a book or a YouTube video at this point. I actually, uh, did you ever meet that guy? I, I don't know what year you graduated, but I know another Berkeley graduate that I follow on Instagram. His name's Killian Duarte. He's in a band called Abiotic, uh, like sh- Scale the Summit, like super great bass player. But every time I see him play, I'm like, it's really funny to watch because I grew up playing bass like as a complete novice. I played just to be able to play in bands and to watch him just go like, oh, I can play slap and I can play fretless and I can just improvise here. And now this is a jazz piece. And then it's like, wow, this guy is just fucking all over the place. Like that, that ability to be able to be a performer with a specific instrument is just it it's it's always floor like it kind of floors me every time i see it oh yeah i was i was totally enamored with with any kind of guys that that would do stuff like that i mean i spent so much money like in high school and early college just you know buying fretless bases buying electric upright bases buying like you know there was one point i was like i was like i think i'm gonna buy uh uh, a nine string bass or like a 12 string bass. <laughs> I was like, just because, because I saw these guys was just things that just, you know, looked like a tree trunk. And I was like, I don't know, I guess that's for me too. But uh, yeah, so I was like, I, I, I spent a lot of time doing crazy shit and just learning all these different styles and, and things like that. Just because I, I love being able to like create these like mishmash of, of various influences. Cause I liked so many different kinds of things. I, I was never, I was never one to like be stuck in one kind of um, sound or headspace for too long. I'm, I'm constantly bouncing around. See again, Tommy, th- I'm telling you, this is the secret to being in a good band that we've cracked on this show. You have to be into a lot of different stuff and you have to incorporate all of those elements into your band. No, I mean, that's actually one, uh, one thing that I keep, telling people if, if 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 they ask like any advice or anything like songwriting wise like so many people disregard the the power of like listening to different kinds of music figuring out what they are doing like on just like on a textbook level and not just like how it sounds you know like what are they what are they doing in the songwriting how are they manipulating the melodies and the structures and like figure out how you can apply that to your genre, you know. So we take a lot of in- influence from like, you know, whatever like kind of like folk bands or uh, electronic music or anything. It's like, and there's these like really cool songwriting techniques that in there that like we'll listen to and be really inspired by. And like, okay, how do we put that in like a Wilderun slash metal context? Yeah, yeah, that's that's. I'm, I want to talk more about the actual arrangements and stuff too momentarily but first 
Okay, so you're in Berkeley. Tell us how you meet the other guys. Well, so I met John first, our drummer. Um, so I, I was um, I was friends with his girlfriend at the time because we were both in the film scoring major. And um, so I went to go see her play a show um, and John was there. So I, I got to talking with him and we just had a lot of like similar interests in like prog and metal and, and stuff in general. And we're like... And you're you're majoring in film scoring, film. Yeah, I, I dual majored in film scoring and uh, electronic production design, which is kind of like all the the synth and and like studio production kind of stuff. But yeah, so like you know, I, I did that typical like Berkeley thing with John, being like, yeah, we should jam sometime, and you know, <laughs> you know, that's that's like a very overused phrase in that uh, <laughs> in that community. But yeah, so I I got to end up. I ended up like jamming with him and um, Joe, who was our um, lead guitarist for a while. So like the three of us started like just like doing like some like classic heavy metal kind of stuff. And then we're like, we need to find a, a, a vocalist. And um, at, at first we were like, we were, we started reaching out to um, Wayne, who's our lead guitarist now. And, um, you know, cause he, he, he loves all like the, the power metal stuff. He, he has like he's got a great voice for that. So we started like seeing like if he wanted to join in that. And then, um, so I'd like, I, I knew those guys. And then one day I'm in the studio it's maybe like 10 at night or something. And I get a text from John being like, Hey, uh, do you want to play in a folk metal band and, um, you know, for a show and just open for tourist sauce? And I'm like, that, yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. I mean, tourist sauce is one of my favorite bands. And, um, so it, it ends up being, you know, will to run, which at, at the time was like Evan's folk metal side project from, um, uh, from the you know, like progressive death metal band he was in. And, um, so I, then I, I meet Evan through that cause he's going to come over my place and sh- show me some songs. So then I got to talking with him and hanging out. And it's like, and then he, so he had kind of wrangled up John for that project and um, and Wayne as well uh, to do like the orchestrations, the guitar, and so we did the we did the the tourist house show, which was just supposed to be like we're just gonna do the one show and then like Wayne and Evan will um, well I guess and John too would would record the the album for Evan in the studio and like someone would like. Wayne would just play bass or something. Uh, but I was like, well, I mean, I already know half the songs. Just show me the, show me the rest of them and I'll, I'll just do it. So when we go into the studio and, and like, this is all just like, you know, at the time we didn't really know what, like we didn't have like a big grand plan of like the future of the band or anything. This was just kind of at the time Evan's folk metal project. And we were just kind of helping him out. But by the end of that that studio session, we had like just really become fast friends, and it just it just became very obvious that I was like, "Oh, the chemistry is really good here. We're just gonna keep doing this because this is great." Nice. So yeah, so it started out, "Oh, we're helping a friend," but then you realized there was a vibe there, and we're just gonna go with it. Yeah, it was. I was like, "Well, why?" Yeah, so I, I was like, "Oh, well, why not just record the the album?" And then after the album was, I was like, "Oh, well, why not just you know do the tour after?" Yeah, it's <laughs> <So> like, <laughs> and then and then we're like, "Oh, well, I guess we need to uh, to put the uh, put the album together and press it and all that." And it's like, "Well, we got to do photos now." I was like, "Well, I guess this, I guess this is the band," you know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you did you just keep doing things, or did you have to ask at some point, like, what are we? Uh, am I a band? Are we a band? Are we together? I don't remember ever like having that conversation. It was almost like after the studio, we just we would all just like look at each other and know it's like, yeah, I mean, we're just gonna do this. Like, I mean, no idea with like what. I mean, for for me personally, like at the time, I was like, my plan was to like do um, audio and music for for games and. TV and movies and stuff. And I, I was just doing the band thing because it was fun. I always enjoyed doing it in high school. And I was like, this is a great group of guys. I'm just going to keep doing this as long as it's feasible. And over time, it just became obvious to me that like the band thing was just more, more inspiring. And, and like anytime I would go to start like a new game project or something like that, I was kind of like, Oh, I just want to work on these orchestrations. I just want to write my bass parts. You know, it's like, and I was like, I, okay, well, now I know I just, 
my my plate's getting way too full. Uh, like the, I had to drop one thing. I was like at the time I was I was working full time as a land surveyor. I was working with Will to Run, and I was um and I was doing the the audio game stuff on the side. So it was like I I can't do all of this and like retain my sanity. So it was the game stuff that ended up having to go. Yeah, I think you have to go where your heart is and where your passion is. I've been in that situation where you're juggling multiple things and it's like, do I do this or do I do this? And, you know, I just drop the thing that's a pain in the ass and do uh, where the fire is. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I certainly enjoyed working on on games and stuff. It was it was cool, um, but it was just... It was just too much, and especially like I, I was working with, uh, I was working in, like a partnership with with a friend of mine, also from Berkeley, and like he he was like r- really into it, and he and he was just like, I mean, he's like a real like gamer dude, so like he knows what's up, and um, and I just realized like oh, I'm I'm just not that kind of guy. Like I, I'm just doing this because I want to make money doing music. And that just seemed to me like the easiest way to do it. Little did I know is like as much work as starting a band, you know, trying to start my own business. Cause I didn't, again, I was like, well, I don't want to work for a company doing stuff like that and get paid pennies. So it's, it was just too much. I would just keep taking bites out of all these things and, 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 and not being able to chew it. So it sounds like you're not a hardcore gamer. You are merely working to create music for games. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. When I was, especially when I was a kid, I I loved games and I would play a lot. But oh, over, once I once I seriously started p- playing bass, like that was my thing. I I kind of more or less stopped playing video games and I would just play bass for eight hours after school every day. And I never really got super into. I tried getting into games again, but it was just like I, I just didn't have the time to. And it's like if I'm gonna do audio for games, I should know what games are like these days and i just i couldn't keep up it was just it just obviously wasn't for me yeah i'm fishing here to see if you game still because uh i'm i'm still a serious gamer oh yeah no i i i I, I, again i I still wish i could be i mean it's i if i had an extra eight hours every day i absolutely (laughs) would i mean you know my my son's starting my son's starting to get into games and stuff and you know like so I'm like, oh, okay, then maybe. Well, this is like a good chance for me to maybe like start getting into things. I mean, you know, four years old is maybe like a little too young for like Grand Theft Auto, but you know, we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, but you know, those uh, little NES like mod, like the emulator ones, those are fun. I showed my daughters that when they were about four or five, and they love Super Mario, Legend of Zelda. Like they they got into that really hard. Oh yeah, no. I mean, my uh, my son's really big into like platformers and stuff on his on his tablet, and and uh, we started playing like. So I just busted out my old PS3, and I was like, "Well, let's see if I got anything around here that's like okay for him." And um, ended up like finding Little Big Planet two, and I was like, "Oh, this is perfect. There's like rated E game. We can both play it." And it, that's been like a really nice kind of like bonding thing, like you know, because and it's it's blows my mind that you know i just see this little four-year-old kid holding a controller and just like kicking ass in this game and i'm just i, I never nev- i've never felt older just trying to <laughs> maneuver you know i was like oh my god this is, reminds me of like when i forced my dad to play video games and he was just like i don't know what i'm doing dude <laughs> i'm picturing playing video games with my hypothetical son and it, it brings me such joy it's great <laughs> I, I can't wait to like that's gonna be See that's that's my chance. Then uh, I'll I'll be able to play more games once, when we'll, once we kind of get into the swing of things with that. So it's not totally lost. <laughs> so the band is together. We're doing this thing. We're getting promo photos taken. We're recording an album. Yes. 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 So what what's next? Do we tour? Do we get on some big tours? Are you going around the world? What happens? So it was mostly like. Um, just kind of self-booked tours and shows and stuff that we would do. So our first tour we did with uh, our buddies in Aether Realm. So we just happened to find like just the one of the few other folk metal bands um, in the U.S. You know, had just released their their first record as well, and we're like, oh, we should do 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 a tour together. So like, you know, they're down from North Carolina. We're we're up in Boston and. 
So we meet up halfway in New Jersey and start the tour from there. And it's, uh, and that was kind of like the beginning of a long friendship with those guys. So we've been very close um, and have done, we've done a total of three tours with them as well as um, some one-off shows here and there. So that was kind of like our, our, our introduction into all that. And, and, and for a while, for a long time, it was just kind of like trying our best to like, how do we get in touch with a booking agent? How do we get in touch with labels? And um, for, for years, it was just kind of like radio silence of any anyone we tried to reach. But, you know, we're cold calling people, essentially. We didn't have any real contacts. Yeah, no, I know that feeling. We We kind of started this show the same way. You know, one thing I didn't realize is there's this whole network of PR people and bookers and all this stuff. And it's it's hard to tap into that in the beginning, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's it's like this insurmountable wall and you're just like how do I how am I supposed to get through this if like I can't like cold like people say cold calling doesn't work because nobody's wants you knocking at their door without, you know, letting them know. And then also like you you're supposed to like gain views and followers and and do everything on your own so that by the time you are an established band, a label will pick you up. It's like, well, how do you do that without a label? So we just, our first three records, we entirely self-released them. You know, so the first one was just like all out of like Evan's pocket. Essentially, he paid for that record. Um, the second one, we're like, okay, well, we can't afford to do that again, especially if we want to make it better. Um, so we did a Kickstarter and that was a great way to like, to get like the fans we had together to pay for something before so that we could just make it in the first place. Like, okay, great. We could do that. But then it was like, well, we don't want to do a Kickstarter again because then it just seems like it, it didn't work or something. Or you're like, I don't know. It seems a little, a little too like asking for, for handouts, I guess. So we, but, uh, luckily, uh, we, we sold enough copies of, of the, uh, of our, our second record to be able to fund the veil of imagination record entirely just with, with album sales and whatever money we made on tours that we were doing. So that felt really good. It was like, okay, that's totally just bought and paid for. We don't have to worry about that. But um, how do we step up our game on that record? Then it's like we, we were constantly searching for ways to just move upward, not just do the same thing. So we're like, well, we have a little money left over. Let's try hiring a PR company. So we ended up hiring um, Adrenaline PR, you know, just as a way to see what happens. And and they like they did a really good job of pitching us to a bunch of contacts and in, in, in the press that they had, and um, and eventually getting us um, in touch with. Uh, with Century Media, I mean, as well as a, a couple other labels that that had contacted us after Veil vale was released. So basically, once that record was released, the floodgates opened like pretty quickly. We had started a tour on November first, just a small like kind of ten or twelve day tour we did. So it was like we released the album November first. We the first day of the tour was November first. And we started like getting all these like very very quickly in the first couple of days. We we're getting like a bunch of merch orders and stuff. And like, okay, well, we're just shipping these, or I, I say we. Evan is just shipping all of these. Just you know, to, to, he's driving to the post office every day with like multiple orders, and and you know, just trying to get everything out there, and just doing the entire distribution and taking orders and everything all by himself, like. He was like, I can't do this anymore. Like, you know, this this too much. So we we ended up from then like getting hooked up with uh, Holy Mountain Holy Mountain Printing, who distributes our U.S. merch now. Um, and that was like a huge load off. And then then it was like, okay, just keep doing that. And and we we ended up sol- selling out of all of the CDs for for veil that we had pressed like we pressed a thousand first and we sold out of them i think within a month or something it was so we're like man we're like all of a sudden we found ourselves very much like caught in the riptide we're like oh this things hit much faster than we expected with with this record and we were just not 
really we didn't have the infrastructure in place to to handle it that's really interesting so hiring this pr firm really turned things around quickly yeah i mean i i think well it, it's twofold so like the pr company did a great job of um getting our name into certain avenues that we weren't in before like i i, I want to say like they had gotten us that that was like our first um first thing on like metal injection or something like that um so it was like okay great like we're finally getting in front of like some bigger audiences um in in, in the press but also it's like the the album itself i think is like veil of imagination there's there's something about that record that i think is like it's a bit more accessible for most people in the metal realm because it's a little it's not quite as like folk metally as sleep at the edge of the earth was and for we were finding as time went on that like uh the folk metal thing is 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 tough to is a tough sell you know there's a lot of labels that we had shopped ourselves to that we found out later um like they're they're just kind of saying like yeah we're just not really signing folk metal bands right now so it's like oh i mean well I mean, we like doing that stuff i mean luckily this next record is like we already knew was going to be a little bit different you know, so it's not like we 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 it's not like we started steering away from folk metal in order to sell more records it was just what naturally was going to happen anyway but it played out in our favor is what i'm saying right and i think that's how these things work if you're trying to manufacture some outcome I find that you end up disappointed more often than not. It's just like with these creative pursuits, you're in it, you're riding the wave, you're doing what you do, and everything just happens to line up. Yeah, it's because you're doing what you want to do. If we if yes. we wanted to make a folk metal record, we would have done that again, despite all odds. And you know, who knows where we'd have been from there. But it's just like Veil of Imagination was the record we wanted to make at that time. Um, like we were just kind of starting to find ourselves like within the folk metal realm starting to like feel like there's i don't know there's not as much to explore there you know like we didn't know what else we could do with it so we're like well let's just kind of do some more to lean a little bit more into like the proggy stuff and just kind of like weirder melodies and song structure and stuff and just see where that goes so you have three records out before you start working with the pr firm did you ever get dejected in the earlier days? You know, were you ever like, oh, it just doesn't seem like this is going anywhere? Or did you have enough support that things were just building? I mean, this the 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 feelings of dejection have always existed in in waves and continue to do so. And you know, for all I know, will con- will continue to do so into the future. Um, but I think that the, there's an element of like needing to put things in perspective that I think is important and something that we um, try and check ourselves with amongst the four of us a lot because it's, it's easy to to look at one small aspect of something that may have not gone or hit the way you wanted it to. And so you feel really down about that, but it's like, at the same time, it's like, Hey, we were also, don't forget we signed to century media. Don't forget. We played 70,000 tons of metal. Don't forget. We just finished a tour with swallow the sun. It's like, like there's a, like a bunch of cool stuff happening, and even before then, it's like like when when we released Sleep at the Edge of the Earth, um, Angry Metal Guy um, had made that record the the album of the month that it came out, and then eventually the album of the year for 2015. It's like and, and we gained like a bunch of followers from that because like people like that that site has a very kind of rabid fan base, and like would uh, so when whenever whenever on that site someone gets album of the year like people are gonna take a listen if not just if not just to like try and find a way to tear it apart but like but it certainly got people listening and 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 that was kind of for us that was like our first moment of like hey we did that on our own with only the the help of like our our kickstarter fan base and now now look we are you know so it's like we try and keep reminding ourselves that there's there's these little things like that that the, the, that's the energy drip that you need to keep yourself going. And you can't just, even if you could, even if I could like open the floodgates and have like all the great things happen right now. And then, you know, it's like, well, then you, you drain the pool, you know, like you gotta, you need that steady drip. 
Yeah, you have a good outlook on this, and it can be really tough during those quieter periods. Like if something isn't going exactly as I planned, I could really get myself down no matter how well I'm doing. Like one little thing goes wrong and I'm like, oh man, I fucking suck. Oh, like this is, it's never going to be better than this, but you just got to pull yourself out of that and keep doing what you do. Yeah, yeah. It's, and that's tough as hell to do. I mean, like, especially, especially in these last couple of years, it's like, you know, we, we signed to the record label and then the uh, pandemic hits and now it's like nobody knows what's going on. So we're signed to a label and we're, we're you're, you're like in the, you're in the big leagues now you're in the swimming with the big fish and you're like, okay, so what do we do now? And everyone's like, I don't know. Like this is unprecedented. <laughs> <laughs> like it's like, okay, great. So now I don't even have like a boat to, to like pull myself up on in these big waters. So like, you know, th- that, that was very, disheartening just to see like we we had like booked our first european uh performances that were supposed to happen in october of 2020 so we had booked those in like early spring and you know when when covid happened everything started going to lockdown we're like like oh man this this sucks i mean well first of all like we we had a tour with uh a turnum that we had to cancel in april of that year and then like little you know so we thought like oh well at least once this is all gone you know in like the summer or whatever like we'll have uh we'll have october and we'll have europe so it's all good we'll make up for it it's like yeah yeah that would have been uh i'm glad i didn't know what i was in for (laughs) (laughs) that would have been way harder to deal with (laughs) yeah it's uh so you got signed to century media before the pandemic broke out yeah it was like so in January of 2020, we had played 70,000 tons of metal. We, uh, we, we got off the boat. We got, um, we got, uh, our, our inboxes where it started like connecting to, to the internet again. And we had like a, a few different like major label, um, offers in our inbox. We're like, damn, that just happened in the last couple of days. So like, you know, we started like, negotiating with with these people with with our lawyer and um through uh, our performance on the boat actually our um w- um Stefan our our manager or one of our managers had seen our performances there and and got in touch with us helped us negotiate the deals and now we're working with him and and uh David who's uh who's kind of like our our main day-to-day manager so like and having having someone like that in in, in your corner when you're dealing with label negotiations really helps because we have no idea like what the what what the standards and practices are for you know it's a, this is a, nothing's written down you would the amount of times i've googled like what does this mean and uh, what uh, what is uh, like what what's a standard this for a, for a label contract then nobody tells you that <laughs> like so it's having a manager who's done it really um, really made us made it easier for us to kind of like pick through the offers and know what was actually good for us. So tell us about the recording of Epigon. When did you start recording it? Did you get sidelined by COVID at all? Yeah. Uh, so we, we, we started recording on, I, I want to say it was like January 4th or 5th, um, of 2021. Um, so we we did get a little sidelined by COVID in the sense that Wayne, our um, who who does at least at the time was just doing our our orchestrations and folk instruments. He was supposed to fly out to Syracuse to to meet us there and and be part of the recording process. Even though he wasn't recording in the studio, he was going to be there to just like you know give us input and just have the whole band there to bounce ideas around. We found out like a few days before we were supposed to go that he had uh, some family issues due to COVID and was not able to, to fly. And um, so we're like, shit, what do we do? Do Do we like postpone the, uh, the recording? Like, or, you know, it's like, well, Wayne doesn't technically need to be there. It's not that like, it's not that we're, we won't be able to record drums or something like that, but it's like, do we want to go into the studio and not have, everything at our disposal 
So we ended up finding out a way to have Wayne kind of like remote into the, to the studio. So we'd have a laptop set up with, you know, like just like a video chat thing. And we found some, I I wish I could remember the name of the software, but it was like, it was uh, something that allowed us to kind of virtually send the output of our, of our console in the studio and have it come through um, Wayne's speakers. Like it's coming out of, his speakers like it like like he's in his room and so it's like he's hearing the full you know full quality wave files coming out and it was fantastic i mean the the way that we were able to to make that work i mean granted you know dealing with lag issues internet issues and all these things like it's not ideal certainly i mean w- if we could do it again 100 percent, we would like do it with him in the room but considering that was our only option for who knows how long um, we were like, I guess, I guess we're just going to do, do it that way. And, and if we found out within the process that it was just the process was going to suffer for it, we would have just shut things down and be like, we'll just pick this up later and, and just eat whatever the cost is. Luckily it, it that wasn't the case and we were able to make it work. But, uh, yeah, I mean, thank God for technology. Absolutely. Yeah. There's like a software for everything now. It's great. All you have to do is Google it and the software does have to work for you. It's wild. It is. I mean, shit, that's how we started this show. And folks, we're talking about Epigon, released January 7th, 2022, on Century Media. This is Will to Run's Century Media Records debut, yes? Yeah, our first, like, recorded album put directly through them. They technically re-released Veil of Imagination in 2020, um, but yeah, I mean, this is the first time that we're like, from start to finish, Century Media was was part of the equation. So let's talk about your recording and artistic process a little bit, because this is a massive album. As we were talking about earlier, there was there's so many different elements to the songs, and they all blend seamlessly together. You know, we've got eight, nine, ten minute songs, and I'm ensconced in every minute of it. Walk us through some of your creative process. How do the arrangements come together? How do all the elements come together? So this album was interesting because, like, the um a lot most of the the core like melodies harmonic structures and song structures were based off of songs that Evan had written uh mostly between the writing of the uh, of our first two records so while we were still in full like folk metal band mode Evan was also on the side writing these tracks to be potentially for like some other kind of like progressive metal uh project that just ended up getting pushed off to the sideline you know as as wilderun got more and more involved in taking up his time it was like well i i, I guess I, I don't know what to do with these songs they don't really fit in a wilderun context and i don't have the time to start a new band eventually you know our sound just kind of morphed into something that upon revisiting these songs were like okay there's there actually is something here that that we could maybe work with and, and the things that are a little different, you know, for the, for a Wilderun sound will prove hopefully to be nice challenges that will unlock some new doors and that, that we haven't explored before. So, so what, what, um, what we had tried doing with this time. So, I mean, let me backtrack a little bit. So for, for all of our previous records, the general way we worked was Evan would, demo out the songs he had written uh with just like you know guitar into into logic midi drums and some whatever preset keyboard things just to sketch out some ideas and then the vocal melodies would just like be played on a guitar or something like that and um and then we would just kind of we would learn those songs and we would write our own parts to them and we would kind of like we would communicate all together on on the arrangements itself and stitch things together slowly and then this record was was a little different in the sense that uh we were thinking like okay well what would happen if when when Evan de- demos out those songs they don't have drums on them and it's just the guitars and a uh, click and just give them to John and let him sit with them for a while and just see what he comes up with. I mean, like, what would that what would that do? 
So he ended up like writing some like really cool stuff. And some of the stuff was just like so out there and different from what um, we had originally intended that we kind of had to like, okay, change this back to something a little simpler or whatever. And then, but then this over here, that's really cool. And like, it completely changes the, the rhythmic feel of, uh, of this part. And it's better than what we would have come up with because, you know, he's looking at it just purely as a drummer. He's like, how do I showcase my abilities and my, as, as not only a, um, a drummer, but also as a, a songwriter and arranger, how do I influence these songs? So then, Evan and John got together for like a week. This would have been sometime in 2019. Uh, I think in the summer maybe. And um, so they were just kind of like bouncing around ideas in um, back and forth, hashing those out, getting kind of the general drum and uh, guitar balance going. Then once they had that, well, um, well actually on, on our way back from, 70,000 tons of metal we were listening to those demos we're like because we're just talking a bit about like yeah what do we do next musically like we, we're, we're kind of in a uh a period of like not having anything in the bank necessarily you know and everyone's like well i have these songs i mean do you think we could maybe do something with that or do we just start from scratch so we listened to the songs and we hung out and we we're just like having some beers and it was like Oh, this is, there's some cool stuff in here, especially once once I listened to it with uh, with like some of John's ideas on. It, I was like, I was completely like, I'd heard this, the the songs before, but now hearing them with like reimagined through through John's eyes, I was like, oh, I hear a lot of stuff in here now that I didn't hear before. I was like, let me let me start getting my bass parts in there. So then then I was like, okay, I spent some time just writing bass parts I, and figuring out like all right i i i got i got these like really interesting gr- drum grooves doing patterns that i'm like i haven't really kind of worked with before cuz before it was always evans demo drums um so that inspired me to do completely different things than i normally would have and it's like okay now we have that that um like kind of rhythm section bass and so the three of us john evan and myself got together in summer of uh, 2021. No, 2020. And uh, <laughs> time it's hard to is, keep track oh, of the yeah. It's I just hard to keep track of the years anymore. <laughs> anything. <is. laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, so, so three of us got together and we kind of like hashed out that that rhythm section, that that core fundamental element, and and kind of we're, we're able to in person like have direct feedback on like the arrangements of the songs and, and how, how things flow as well as like starting to structure the album and look at things more conceptually. And then once we had done that, then it's time for Wayne and I to start the orchestration process. So we were trying to think like, okay, um, how do we do this? So for the, for the last two records, um, sleep and veil, um Wayne was working at um at Hans Zimmer's um uh, Bleeding Fingers uh, organization doing like music for for film and TV stuff or or just TV stuff uh and he was just completely like it was just slammed work wise so like for him to be able to work on Wilderon stuff was a, a very very much a like time to work through the night kind of thing and so for those records, it was like I would do like a first pass of all the orchestrations for the record, and then he would come do his pass, you know, like kind of changing some things on on my end, adding some th- things on top, and you know, and then I would go over, and it would just be like taking turns throwing the ball back and forth. On Epigon, we had um, like he had stopped working there, so he like he had some more time to invest in that. And we're like, okay, well, we both want to work right now. How do we, how do we even logistically do that? Because like, how do we like share a session and deal with all like, you know, don't overwrite my files and all that. And (laughs) (laughs) so like, like that, that sounds like a pain in the ass. And um, so I'd suggested like, well, we had talked about like making synths more of like a prominent 
thing on this record since like we had we'd messed around with a little bit on veil but it was all like kind of more background stuff stuff that was meant to kind of like change the texture of the orchestra slightly in ways that you wouldn't necessarily know that there's a synth happening and on this record it was like okay let's let's just make it like this isn't like we always looked at as like there's you know the guitars the bass the drums the vocals and the orchestra now it's like okay now it's all of those and the synths and they're equally important so i was like well why don't i just just deal with synths and you just deal with orchestra and we'll uh we'll obviously communicate as we always have we would we always spend hours time stamping every single section of the song with notes of various ideas we have so it's like the synth ideas are partly wayne's ideas and the orchestra ideas are partly my ideas but they're just all the orchestra stuff is executed by wayne and all the synth stuff is executed by me on this record so and then from there it's just back and forth again you know just keep on throwing stuff around and then change stuff in in the the rhythm section to to match some of the new ideas that were spawned in that process and you know and then it comes time to record and even then we're still changing stuff around uh one of the things we've been doing since our second record is uh taking two chunks of studio time so one we would do we would record the the all the band stuff, drums, guitars, bass. Um, and then we would have like a certain period of time in between the two sessions that we would then have to like change things in the orchestra um, and the synths that to, to better reflect now what is like actually recorded, you know, now that we can hear with like the, the studio, like quality tones and, and, and really just kind of m- more mixed, how does that influence what we did before? So we'll take some time to 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 fine tune that. Then we go into the studio again. We record all the uh, acoustic guitars, vocal instruments, and vocals. And then after that, um, depending on how that all went um, and how everything was sounding in in our ears in the studio, we'll maybe go back and revisit the orchestra and the synths even again if they need it. I mean, hopefully at that point, it's very minor stuff. Sometimes it's not. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so, the, and then that's kind of the end of the process. After that, it's like, it's, it's mixing time, which, I mean, takes forever with us because we're way too picky about everything. But we've been very fortunate to work with some, like, some real champion mix engineers who are real pros at what they do. So it's a little, it gets a little less painless every time. <laughs> I should say a little less painful, not a little less painless. That would imply that things are getting worse. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, it's there's a lot that goes into this and you can really hear it when you listen to the record, both in just the the different layers to it and the recording itself. I mean, the the production itself on Epigon is top notch. Yeah, no, I'm really happy with the, the, the way the whole album sounds like. One of the best things that we did production wise on this record was turning the gain way down on on the guitar amps. So like the main rhythm guitar tone is a, a combination of two amps. The main one is a uh, a bad cat combo amp, uh, which is kind of like known to be generally more as like a kind of a rock amp. So it's like it's not something that like is all squishy and heavy like you would expect out of a metal band. And then the second amp is uh, a PV um, 6505, which is Evan's amp, which ha- is a bit more of that bitey high gain thing. And you kind of blend it so like the bad cat would like sit on top in the mix, and then the 6505 would like just kind of caress it, you know, like give it a little extra oomph where you need it, but you could dial it back and have a real like real more bare bones tone which was great for for Evan's playing style because he's like he's much more of this open chord playing kind kind of guy so he's he's not doing like power chords so much so he likes to just be able to use the full breadth of the instrument and um that allowed for when those moments happen on the record where he's just strumming to not be as abrasive and overbearing on all the orchestral and synth elements in the mix so everything had a little bit better of a time sitting with one another so the record is out now it's been out now for almost a month how has the response been are we happy with it 
Do we have big things coming up now? The response seems to be very good. I mean, all the all the reviews I've been seeing and um, and comments that uh, have come my way have uh, have been pretty positive. And I, I you know, we had uh, we just charted on the on the U.S. billboards for the first time, which was really amazing. We we charted again on the on the uh, German billboards. So like that that is impressive. I mean for knowing just how difficult it is for a metal band let alone a like progressive symphonic whatever band to to have that kind of an impact is really really cool. As far as like things we have in the tank right now it's like uh, not too much unfortunately. <laughs> you know <laughs> that that situation is still ongoing. And needless to say, but, um, I mean, we do one thing that we do have coming up that I, I, I do want to always mention is that we, we have, uh, we're playing Prague power USA in, um, in June and that will be our first time playing that festival, which is something that I've been wanting to go to as a fan forever now. So getting to play it is really special for me, but it'll be nice to be like, play a festival have like a bit longer of a set to like really ex- explore more of our catalog maybe play some songs that we haven't we don't bust out too often and uh yeah so i mean that's what's on the books right now as aside from that we're trying our damnedest working with the uh, the label and with our management um just trying to see what's out there you know hopefully we can get more uh, supporting act tours. I mean, the the tour we did with Swallow the Sun at the end of the last year was really great for us to be able to like get exposed to new audiences that may not have heard of us. But, uh, you know, it was like really cool to get off stage, go to the merch booth and um, have people tell me like, oh, I'd never even heard of you guys before. I just happened to catch your set. And uh, now I just bought all your records. I'm like, great. Excellent. That's the that's the reason that we're here doing these things. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. So how does it how do you pull it off live? You've got so many different elements in here. What uh how are we recreating the sound live? Well, it's 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 backing tracks are obviously a big part of it. Um so we have whenever we're uh, finished with a record, we always ask for um stems of the of the orchestra, acoustic guitar, synths, and uh, choirs and what's the last thing folk instruments so we have all those separate and we can kind of place them in these back and tracks according to what we need so like the orchestra and the synths are always there because we don't have an orchestra on stage and we don't have a keyboardist on stage and and then like the acoustic guitar stuff like i'll throw in only if it's like a backing thing that's like behind like a metal section but if it's like a quiet part um, then it's like, well, Evan's just going to play that on cl- like a clean electric guitar channel. Mm-hmm. So like that stuff, like we always have to like tell the, the mix engineer every night, be like the, the backing tracks need to be loud. They're, they're like the fifth member of the band. So like, don't just, don't just bury them. Like there's just some ambient, uh, like soundscapey things happening in between tracks. So that, that's like the, like the meat of it is that stuff. And then, um, and then how we perform live on on stage sometimes changes depending on how things are actually executed. You know, I mean, sometimes there's things you do in the studio that, like, you, you'll layer certain things that just are not possible to do live for whatever reason. And you sometimes have to change things around. But uh, I think one of the things that I actually really enjoy about the... Um, the, the live aspect is that people oftentimes get a chance to hear the band with a little bit more of like a band focused mix, um, mm-hmm. which is interesting because I've, I've, I've talked to a couple of my friends about this before and they say like, yeah, whenever I see you guys play live, it's all the songs are like so much heavier live, you know? And I, and he says like uh, one of my friends, Ian, um, he, he always says like, yeah. So cause when, when you're hearing it live, the, the guy mixing is just, he's automatically going to think more about like, you know, the kick drum and then the, the, the bass and the guitars and they're, they're going to be a bit more focused and you get to just hear that, like the will to run songs through the production of like someone who is like mixing it more like a metal band. 
you know, because we 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 have to like on the records, we tend to go we stray away often from uh, what's expected of a metal band. Like our rhythm guitars are are noticeably quiet um, in a lot of sections of our records because there's so much other things going on that are arguably more interesting. So like don't step on those but live it's like it's different you don't have that kind of automation i like that so live it's almost like you're going to get a new and exciting experience yeah so i mean i i always some of the guys get like always disappointed when they when they're like oh, i know the i know the tracks weren't weren't loud in the mix and people didn't get to he- hear all the cool orchestral and synth stuff and i'm like well I mean, they they got that in the records, so I always I always say like that, <laughs> this is a new sound that they don't get to hear in any other place. You know, it's like this is the one time you you might hear Wilderun as just more as a like a metal band. I like that. And how about this? I'm I'm envisioning this for you one day, Dan. Wilderun plays a show, and you have a full orchestra, and then like a full choir, and then a synth player, and then. Uh, a, an acoustic setup, acoustic guitar setup on stage too. What do you think? I mean, I I think that would be the kind of show that we've always been wanting to play <laughs> from yes. from the very beginning of this band. We've always said like one day we will do such a show, and but then the the, the caveat to that is one day we might not have that much money. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. <laughs> That's the that's the plan, but uh, that's definitely yeah. I mean, hundred percent like bucket list items for me. That's that's probably at the top of the list. Okay, so folks, here's what we're gonna do. All right, number one, we are gonna listen to the Will to Run discography. It's out there, right? Yes, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna do that. That's number one. Number two, we're gonna listen to Epigon, which was just released January seventh of this year on Century Media Records. Ooh, we've got to hear that record. I mean, come on, right? Please do. I'm I'm very proud of that one. As well you should be. You know you've got two new fans with us. We really dig it. And number three, we are going to catch Wildevrun live. Prague Power USA, June 2nd in Atlanta, Georgia. There you go. Uh, any other shows or potential tours in the works or is it all messed up because of covid uh in the works but messed up because of covid <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah there's there's the things that are trying to happen well i i hope they do that it, yeah, it's it's like back to square one you know things are canceled things are postponed again you just you just never know what's going to happen these days yeah i know it's it's frustrating but uh yeah. you know trying trying to stay bright and shiny and happy Exactly. That's the that's the daily challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, we just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. You know, we love the record and uh, we wish you all the best. So thank you. Thank you for uh, for giving us your time tonight. Hey, thanks so much. This was a lot of fun. And I, uh, I wish you guys the best with your show as well. And keep at it. This was this was great. There you have it, folks. Dan Mueller. Excellent conversation. Great new band. I'm glad that we discovered them. I'm really digging Epigon. It was great to talk to them, you know, to hear their process and how everything came together. It was just uh, it was just really good. Also, something we didn't get to in the interview, but their artwork is fucking wild. It's so good. Like they're, I, w- yeah. I would hang that in my house. Like that's how good their artwork is. Yeah, I really like it. It's perfect music for... There's this guy I watch on Twitch who plays EverQuest, and I always want to be like, "Have you ever heard Will to Run?" It would be like, oh. it would be like the perfect soundtrack for that game. <laughs> I've never seen that game. I have to look that up. It's good. You know, it's older by this point, but look, it's good. It's some serious, serious nerd shit. But that's my shit. So yeah, that's some role playing stuff. Like I sit down and make some arrows for a couple hours, and you know that kind of stuff. <laughs> but uh, thanks, Dan, for being on the show. We. We really loved it. Now, Tommy, the big news this weekend was that we hung out. Yes, we did. At Gary Shaw's 40th birthday party. I came down and met Tommy at Trenton with my friend Chris Rogie, and he is my friend and bandmate, and we've all known each other for a long time. And Tommy took us on a 
wild ride through Trenton. And you know what I realized? The the back roads that Tommy was taking were actually longer than just getting on Route 1 from the train station. So, Tommy, you were, you were flexing to show us that you knew how to get through Trenton, weren't you? <laughs> no, I just, I just wanted to get the Route 1 the way I wanted to. I hate that way that they had it there. You have to get on Route 1 north and then get off and then get back on south. It's such a pain in the balls. Like, it's just, I don't like doing that, so I just went the other way down East State Street. So I, it, it, was, I it was wild to see some of that shit, though. <laughs> I got to see Tommy's family. I saw his mom, oh, yeah. his stepdad, his wonderful children. That was nice, right? Yeah, that was a good time. We, did, My mom brought over Burger King for everybody. It was fucking amazing. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't seen your mom since, I don't know, the mid-2000s, I think. <laughs> she remembered me, though. She's like, I know you. I don't know you, to Chris. <laughs> she knows you as the kid. She She's like, I fixed your hoodie. She fixed your ink and dagger hoodie. That was the one she, when the front of it ripped, she fixed your ink and dagger hoodie. <laughs> That's what she oh, remembered. Oh, right. That's yeah, what she, she remembered. It, yeah. <laughs> and it was funny watching the dynamic between Tommy and his mom. Like, Tommy was like, I had to do chores and I had to do this when I was growing up. And she was like, ah, whatever. It was like <laughs> nice mother son moments. <laughs> I like when, whenever my mom brings up something from, or when I bring up something from the past that my mom doesn't like she'll turn and stare at me like in a solid like five <laughs> seconds she won't say a word but she just looks at me with this like look like how fucking dare you say something like this there's, <laughs> there's people here asshole like and in my uh, head i'm going you know what that was not the time or the place to do it like if we were having a personal conversation but like my daughter's one on allowance we brought up bringing doing chores and i was like i came home every day there was a list of stuff to do my mom's like yeah well you ate for free so stop <laughs> And I was defending Tommy's mom. I was like, you, <laughs> Tommy, you had a place to eat. You had, to, you, you had a place to sleep. Come on. You 100% were on her side, which wasn't. I hope. was like getting involved. <laughs> because, you know why? You know why I felt guilty? Because I brought up the whole thing in the first place. Because I saw a, a chore list on Tommy's fridge. And I was like, hey, just like your mom used to make you do. Because we talked about it on the podcast. So I was like doing damage control. But <laughs> I was going to say, she, my mom made fun of how long it took me to empty the dishwasher it took him like an hour to empty the dishwasher i'm like what are you talking well about? yeah i mean if it, it shouldn't take you that long Tommy. it shouldn't but it, here's my thing i don't think it ever did i think she just makes stuff up to like make it seem like she wasn't as controlling no, and, and I, crazy. I believe her i think you were <laughs> you, you were probably on the phone yakking away in, and look once you get into a conversation there's no getting out we know that on the house phone Really? Yeah. I was on the house yeah. phone talk. Get out of here. That that's all there was. It was like nineteen ninety six. What are you talking exactly. about? Exactly. What who was I talking to on my house phone? There's nobody I, I would call my conversations were all right, Doug, I'll meet you here. Done. That was my fucking conversation. I don't sit on the phone with anybody. I don't believe it. I think you were on the phone. <laughs> it had a cord. <laughs> Well, we got to the party and it was great. Gary Shaw, bass player of this day forward, celebrated forty years old. We saw Mike Shaw, vocalist of This Day Forward. He had the new scene shirt on. Ooh, oh, yeah. ah. It looks good. If you were in our Instagram story, you saw a picture of that. I saw some other friends I haven't seen in a long time. Colin from Circus Survive was there. Hadn't seen him in a long time. Yep. At one point, he was deep in conversation with Tommy, and I hadn't really spoken to him yet, and I wanted to break in, so I walked up and interrupted the conversation, and I was like, Colin, is it weird to be talking to both of us in real life and he <laughs> laughed and he was like no and then i left <laughs> <laughs> yeah there it, was different factions of people at the party though there was like gary friends that i called them yeah. it was people that i knew only through gary and they're nice guys and everything but i just i i forgot their names except dustin i know dustin and then there was some like deep deep gary people that like i think only gary and eileen know yeah and they were kind of separate from everybody the whole time but we had our little factions. There was like the Gary people. And then there was me and you and your wife talking. And then Pat would be involved. And then me and Jeremy won, I think, three games of pool in a row against Mike and his brother Wade. And the only reason we won <laughs> is because Wade kept scratching the eight ball. And like, I'm horrible at pool. I'm like, Tommy, you saw me play. I'm atrocious. I, you're really, you, you can be honest. Go yeah, ahead. You're Go really ahead. bad, but I, <laughs> here's the only thing uh, you're, you're at the point where like you can 
you're bad enough to try. I'm so bad. I would be even like, I, I, I would be embarrassed to even try and play in front of other people. Yeah. Like that's how bad I am. Like I miss the ball when I hit it. Like I, like the pool, like the cue goes over the ball and then it just slides on the side. Like, eh, like I, it, I'm like, I'm like really bad. At one point, Pat kept saying I was hitting the ball wrong or something. And, and I, I shot and then I just completely whiffed and missed. And I, and I blamed it on Pat. I was like, shut up. I'm trying to shoot. And he's like, all right, go again. It, it was like, it's like brotherly <laughs> fun fighting, you know? <laughs> there was a point in time where you took a shot and the, somehow you hit a ball and the cue ball went off the table. I'm not sure how that oh, happened. That was sick. Yeah. I, I don't know how that happened. It was like the other, it was like you hit a ball, but it still managed to make its way off the table. I was like, what the fuck just happened? But, uh, you know, luckily there were a couple people around that actually knew how to play. Uh, Wade was pretty good. Yeah, he was good. Yeah. How did you feel about the party, Tommy? I had a great time. I think my biggest thing is, is I I like reconnecting with people I haven't talked to in a long time, especially with that kind of atmosphere. It was a, you know, it was an open bar. Uh, You know, people are loose. People are having conversations. It was really nice to reconnect and talk to people. And I always make a point when it's a situation like that with people I haven't seen in a very long time. You know, some of those people I haven't seen, you know, in 15 years or so uh maybe longer yeah just a piece of advice keep it light (laughs) like if you're ever at something like that keep it light specifically because you don't want to get into a really heavy conversation when the mood is like very light and fun and everybody's having a good time and it's a birthday party like don't be like how's your mother oh she's dead like no 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 just (laughs) just how is everything going how was your day today um you know what? What books are you reading right now? What le- records are you listening to? That kind of stuff. Keep it. Keep it very simple because the the last thing you want to do is get involved in someone pouring their heart out over a pool table. On the podcast, we can get heavy, mm-hmm. but in real life, keep it light. That's good advice, Tommy. And you know, it's awkward for me because I don't drink, and I'm just awkward in general. Like I found when I was talking to people, I was like panicky oh. i find that in general when i'm talking to people i'm like panicky and i'm like dude just sit there and talk relax it's fine and my i didn't want to leave that you remember that room where we sat down to eat dinner oh yeah <laughs> i didn't want to get back up i just wanted to isolate in there and just talk to you and pat <laughs> and your wife because and jeremy because we had a good table going yes we did but I, was, I fought that urge and i got up and i circulated and i talked to people because i knew it was the right thing to do and i'm glad i did well you got to see me i had two beers while we were there it was crazy <laughs> i was looking at tommy like a science experiment <laughs> <laughs> it's, it was really nice though it like they had yinling on tap so i was like oh i never drink yinling on tap i was like i'll have a couple and uh yeah it was yeah. nice it, it, it's it's i still am reminded like if i get that like fuzzy kind of feeling from a drink you know what it's time to put it down for a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah you know who's really fun who's that your wife oh yeah she's a blast isn't she she's like great to talk to it was awesome and, you know, she is a really good person in terms of – so we were talking to Rogi, right? And yeah. my wife is a teacher in the school district where Rogi went to school. And my wife immediately was like, you know, not to, to be like, you know, hey, let's – who are you? How do you know Gary? She was like, hey, you went to the Chamonix, right? And he was like, yeah. And she's like, talk to me about gym night. What's that all about? I see it on Facebook all the time and people go nuts for it. What's that all about? He went on like a 20 minute story about how he was involved in it and all this stuff. And I was like, what a great conversationalist. Like I would have been like, (laughs) Hey, tell me about your childhood. You know what I mean? Like I would have, like I would have gone into something that would have been either inappropriate or something that didn't fit. She knew like one thing about him and was like, I'm going with this. I was like, fuck, that was really smart. She's a pro. She she knows what she's doing, unlike us, Tommy. Oh, 100%. If she ran this podcast, <laughs> there would be 10,000 views a week. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, she is in charge of the podcast now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> by the way, Tommy, that reminds me. You have to share the news. With what? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I got that job. <laughs> Tommy has gotten his promotion. And folks, he is now making more money than me. So he will be in charge of the podcast. He will be piecing together the uh, agendas and guests and editing. And look, if you make more money, you have to do all the work. That's the rule. 
I, I will say this. I, my salary isn't completely finalized. I can, I'm actually going to have a conversation on Tuesday of next week uh, where I'm going to finalize it. But I, there's still, I think, some room for some negotiation because they put out the other salary, which is the teacher salary, which I would still be at. And I feel like the gap between my promotion and the teacher salary I would be making is not large enough to warrant me being a 12 month employee, which with this new job would be, it's like, if I just stayed a teacher, I would, you know, not make much more money doing this new job, which is increased responsibility, increased work hours, increased time and job. Like, you know, it, there's a lot of that goes along with it. So it's like, I, I feel like I have a little bit more, uh, wiggle room now and to kind of maybe make it go up a little bit. Wow. Tom, look at Tommy deep in salary negotiations. He's always <laughs> up to something. I love it. <laughs> Shotguns, salary negotiation. Let's go. His hero is gone. Oh, oh yeah. And we talked about the his hero is gone wedding song story. And I realized it was just the song to pick to walk out to the reception to. Yeah. The fact that you even fucked that up, Tommy, like you got that taken away from you. It just shows that you can't be making these decisions. She made it as she kind of put it as I was she was in charge of this, this and this. Tommy's in charge of the music. And one of the things I made sure like when I was going through it is I, I made her that playlist and she was like, yeah, this is fine. And then literally I, it was two days before the wedding. She was so like, she didn't listen to it until two days before. Probably. No, definitely. Because once she heard what you picked, well, you got, you got your card revoked. No, the, his hero is gone. She really liked it. Cause she was like, oh, it starts out real soft and gets heavy. I like that. I don't think she really no. understood how heavy it got. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I don't buy it. I, I think. Uh, I think she wasn't listening. I think once she listened to it, she she pulled the plug. Well, listen, the party was great. It was great seeing a lot of old friends. It was great seeing Tommy. You know, Tommy and I don't get to hang out in person too often. And Mike Shaw is like so supportive. He really had me pumped up, you know, talking about the podcast and how great everything is. And it's, I don't know, it's just nice coming from him because I used to look up to this day forward and everything he was doing. It's a, time is a flat circle, Tommy. <laughs> it certainly is. What's that dude's name? Reggie Ledoux? Yeah. Yeah, fucking A. We talk about True Detective a lot on this show. All right, <laughs> folks, that's all we've got. We hope you enjoyed the episode. We're back next week with a new episode and a new guest. So make sure you tune in. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and until next time. Yay!